This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, I'm very pleased that uh, Sue Jones has come along uh, to speak. I think I've been trying to sort of get a um, speak here for quite some time, and you know I can understand that if you, you know you're in doing research, you've got to feel that you've got something you want to um, uh, present, um, and. Um, if you follow the discussions that will exchange to be had on Twitter, you will know that this isn't really mainly about pirates. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. So you can leave now if you like. Um, if you've got some strange obsession with pirates. Um, uh, but it is, we've got the title here. Um, do we need to turn the lights? I think um, it's up to people. Um, you can see it, but it's Can quite you see okay? It's it's mainly, there's not going to be loads and loads of images. It's You're just okay? I've got a few long quotes. Not, that unfortunately, so you can either have them on or off. We can't dim them. So we either sit here in the dark or we sit here in the light. I mean, I don't... It's really up to people. Okay. So let's see how see it goes. It. Yep. If we can't see something, we may need to... Mm. Okay, Sue, over to you. Okay, yeah, sorry. I feel like I'm here a bit under false pretenses, really. Um... I'm actually doing a PhD in English literature, so I'm not a historian anyway, and I keep being told by historians that you have to be a trained historian to talk about these things. And I'm, So I'm not a trained historian, I'm an English literature person, and I'm doing my PhD on pirates and early modern perceptions of the sea as a space where the usual rules might not apply and where men and women had a greater freedom <coughs> to determine how they lived their lives, basically. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk to you loads about pirates tonight, because frankly I get a bit sick of them so um, these are kind of young pirates sort of teenage pirates I'm going to speak to you about so um, basically I'm talking about sort of moments in history where people make their decisions it's kind of history from below kind of thing Um, so I'm talking about young boys running away to sea basically Um, so the early modern sea was a dangerous place and seafaring was a hazardous occupation with a constant risk of injury or disease, the possibility of capture, enslavement or shipwreck, and a high mortality rate. Um, Richard Hacklut remarked of seamen that no kind of men of any profession in the Commonwealth pass their years in so great and continual hazard of life, and since of so many, so few grow to grey hairs. Although men such as Raleigh, Drake and Hawkins had made their fortune and reputation, sometimes very dubious reputation, from their adventures at sea, the ordinary seaman was often viewed with suspicion and disdain. So today I'm going to talk to you about young men who, in defiance of their families and of social convention, actively chose a life at sea despite having other much safer options by which they could make a living. Some of the men, ordinary seamen, left extensive journals in which they described their exploits, their youth, and crucially for my purposes, their decision to go to sea. I'm going to talk about just a few of these journals and what they can tell us about adolescent ambition and the changing nature of society during this period. And I'm looking at kind of the long 17th century, so from about 1580 through to about 1720 or so. Um, So firstly, I want to consider one of the best-known figures in maritime literature, Robinson Crusoe. So in The Life and Strange Surprising Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, which was first published in 1719, Crusoe famously tells us that he has a longing for the sea, much against the wishes of his family. And he says, Being the third son of the family, and not bred to any trade, my head began to be filled very earnestly with rambling thoughts. My father, who was very ancient, had given me a competent share of learning as far as house education and a country free school generally goes, and designed me for the law, but I would be satisfied with nothing but going to sea, and my inclination to this led me so strongly against the will, nay the commands of my father, and against all the entreaties and persuasions of my mother and other friends, that there seemed to be something fatal in that propension of nature tending directly to the life of misery which was to befall me. There have been a number of readings of Crusoe's decision to give himself over to this fatal propension of nature and leave his settled home for the sea. These range from it being a decision made on a purely economic basis through to it being a consequence of original sin or indeed a completely inexplicable act lacking any logical basis. Um, Critical studies locate Crusoe's decision within Defoe's religious and moral landscape, 
often considering Robinson Crusoe as a response to spiritual texts such as Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. However, they've really, cons they've really considered accounts of Crusoe's real-life precursors. I argue that in recounting Crusoe's wayward desire to go to sea, Defoe places his protagonist within a genre of life writing by seamen, which would have been completely recognisable to his contemporary readers. Crusoe stands in the footprints of many other young men who had made that choice before him and who had left a record of how and why they came to, th to that decision. So here's the pirate bit. Um, in 1586, Raphael Hollinsedge recorded the hanging of the pirates Purser and Clinton, which had taken place in 1583. He gave a de description of the upbringing and family life of Clinton, stating that Clinton was of honest parents who had the good opinion of their neighbours. Clinton's father was a religious man who eventually became a minister. Hollinshead takes pains to stress to the reader that Clinton met his end at execution dock because he did not follow the example of his father. And he stated that we are to mark that it is not always true that good parents have good children. For here is an example of degeneration procured not by evil education, for this Clinton wanted no good bringing up, but by bad company and liberty, the very spoil of many a one that might otherwise live and thrive. Wherein, by the way, we are to wonder at the counsels of God, who suffereth children to so much vary from their parents in quality, as if they had not received their birthright and were bastards and changelings. Clinton's father was the perfect moral example, devout and with good standing in his community. Yet Clinton chose not to follow his father's course. He was given too much liberty, giving him freedom <coughs> to exercise his choice and choose a different path. For Hollinshead, to vary from one's parents was to behave unnaturally, and any legitimate son would claim their birthright and follow in the footsteps of their righteous father, always assuming their father was righteous, of course. Um, Hollinshead implies that Clinton's refusal to do so sealed his fate and set him on his inexorable journey <coughs> to the gallows. So defiance of parental wishes is a recurrent theme in the writings of those drawn to the sea, and there's an unusually vivid first-person account in the journal of Edward Barlow, who lived 1642 to 1706. At 225,000 words long, Edward Barlow's journal is one of the most extensive autobiographical accounts we have of the life of a 17th century seaman. And he tells the story of his life from 1656, when he was 14, until 1703, just three years before his death. It provides a particularly detailed account of his adolescence and the events which led up to his eventual career at sea. Records show that Barlow was baptised on the 6th of March 1642 in Prestwich. His parents, George and Anne, were very poor with six children including Edward. His father was a husbandman with a meagre living of about eight or nine pounds a year. And the question of what trade Barlow would take up begins to exercise him very early on in his narrative and he immediately begins to articulate a yearning for travel. And he says, I, having no mind to any trade from a child, always having a mind to hear our neighbours and other people tell of their travels and of strange things in other countries and of their manners, and all, having always a mind to see fashions, was forced to go to work with our neighbours, sometimes when they had any need of me. He describes himself as unable to fix on a particular trade from a young age and is possessed of a wanderlust, wanting to hear about travel and of strange things. This sentence gives an immediate insight into Barlow's character and his disposition towards mobility, but also sets up the opposition between desire and duty, which frames the first part of his journal. Because Barlow's father was poor, he found it difficult to place his children in apprenticeships as, a, as an initial placement bond was often required. But eventually Barlow was sent for a fortnight's trial apprenticeship with a bleacher working in the cloth trade. Barlow was reluctant from the outset, constantly complaining of the difficulty, difficulty of the work. And I have to say, I've read all 225,000 words of his journal and he moans and complains all the way through. He's a proper moaner, is Edward Barlow. Um, but meanwhile, his brother had been sent to work at their uncle's tavern in London, a job which Barlow says he should have had, as it would have given him the opportunity to travel. 
And he said, then I, sh I should have seen some strange things, which I always had a desire to see, and to travel from one place to another. For if any of our neighbours had any business in any of the next shires, and wanted anyone to go along with them, or if they would send me by myself, I was always ready to go and serve them to the utmost of my small power in any journey, thinking by going I should see some town or place which I had not seen before. Again, Barlow stresses his innate desire to travel. He's always had this longing and shows how even on a very small scale he's taken pains to follow this urge. He befriends a fellow journeyman whilst he's an apprentice and together they pass the time avoiding work and discussing the glamour of travel. Oh yeah, so then he says, we would often tell what a fine thing it was to travel and how many times they that had gone a long time returned very gallant with a good store of money in their pockets, which made me think that they got their money very easily with a great deal less trouble than I was likely to get any, which made me resolve not to tarry long. So travel equals financial gain for the young Barlow and at this point in his life he sees the life, a life at sea as a means to make money easily a view he comes to change later when he bemoans the difficult life of the mariner. Um, he eventually tells his father that he doesn't want to continue with the apprenticeship and cites the poor food and unfair treatment by his master as the reason. Though these kinds of complaints were commonly made by apprenticeships, apprentices against their masters, Barlow has an ulterior motive and confides in the reader his real reason for terminating the apprenticeship. He says, for my mind given to see places more remote, I could not settle myself to stay at my master's. So he goes back home to his parents and he worries that his family and neighbours will disapprove of him for not persisting with the apprenticeship. He hears them saying that he would never stay anywhere as he was given to wandering, which marks him out as different. And in an age where the ideal for a young man was to be subordinate, either to his father within the family or to a master within an apprenticeship or service, Barlow would neither comply with his father's wishes nor be bound in an apprenticeship. By rejecting the apprenticeship, which his father had found difficult to secure in the first place, Barlow denied both himself and his family a route out of poverty and into a settled place within the social and economic life of the community. Whether the disapproval of his neighbours actually existed or was merely guilty conjecture on Barlow's part, it provided him with the excuse to finally act on, it, on his desires and leave home to travel the world. He describes the moment he leaves home in such vivid detail that it must have been very significant for him. And bear in mind that he was writing this part of his diary a number of years later, but he really kind of dwells on it. Um, so he'd just been out, his mum had sent him out to get some bread. And I've put it up, it's quite a long quote, but I just think it's really <coughs> interesting. Um, so he says, coming home, I went up to my, my chamber where I lay and put on my best clothes. So coming down the stairs, my mother and one of my sisters being in the house and not knowing my intent, marvelled to see me put on my clothes that day because was, he was putting his best clothes on and it was a normal day. So passing them by, not staring at all, I bid them farewell and came out of the house. They sat still a while to see whether I would go, and by and by, when I was gotten almost out of call, my mother came out, and seeing that I did intend to go, called to me in the manner you see here drawn, beckoning her hand to come again, and willing me not to go, I could not tell whither, and if I would go, to stay till my father came home, and to see what he would say to it. Yet with all her persuasion, she could not entreat me to stay. And he also does this brilliant illustration his oh you can't really see that at all um i don't know if you want to turn the light out just so that you can it's really faint anyway but this is edward barlow's mum and she's sort of beckoning him to stay and this is him legging it this is his house which is massively too big for their house it's kind of quite a big sort of tudor house there um and he's walking across it's labeled it says my father's house in the wheat field um, and he's just walking along the wheat field. He's got his little staff and he's got a knapsack on his back and stuff. And there's 147, I think, illustrations in Barlow's journal. They're almost all of ships and um, coastlines and bays where he goes and stays. And this is the only illustration with him in it and with another person. So it's the only picture of him in a, in a human relationship, basically. And I find it quite moving, really. Um, but anyway. <laughs> 
So you can. The, the journal actually is in the Caird Library in the Maritime Museum. It? It's actually been restored at the moment, but it's well worth a look, and they've got some bits of it online, um, the pictures and things, if you want to have a look at it. Um, yeah, so his mother's the dominant figure in the foreground, and she's stretching her arm out and trying to get him back, but he's off, he's going, and it's basically stepping off the page into another part of his life, really. Um, so he goes to London and he makes his way to London to stay at his uncle's tavern and that's the Dog and Bear in Southwark which is a post house for all the mail going to Kent basically. And on arrival in London he describes the first glimpse he has of the Thames and of seagoing ships. And he says, first inquiring the way to the bridge and coming there, I looking below the bridge upon the river and seeing so many things upon the water with long poles standing up in them and a great deal of ropes about them, <clears throat> it made me wonder what they should be, not knowing they were ships, for I had never seen any before that time. Now I think that's a bit of artistic license. It seems completely disingenuous <coughs> to claim that he'd never, he didn't know what a ship looked like. Even though he might not have seen a large ship before, he must have seen small river boats and barges and been able to recognise a ship. And the River Airwell runs quite near to his childhood home and that was a major trade route in the area. So, so it's pretty hard that he had no, no idea of what a ship looked like. And I think it's maybe a kind of authorial device on his part to, to kind of show that he'd got a, a sort of mystical calling to the sea, that he was drawn to these things even though he had no idea what they were really. Um, so he goes to work for his uncle and he complains about working for, for his uncle and particularly complains about his uncle's wife and he quarrels with her quite a lot. And I think it was quite a common thing for apprentices to complain about having to take orders from a woman because it, kind of, it was a, a subverting of what they thought the order should be. But So that there's a lot of complaints apprentices made about women and wives of their masters and things so, but Barlin complained anyway. Um, so his uncle sent him to try out an apprenticeship at a tavern in Dartford where he stayed for a few days but he didn't like that either um, so and he found himself always returning as if mesmerised to the Thames and he said oh no I've gone too far now yep. Oh yeah, well. Um, so he said of that, and still my mind was to see the ships and boats upon the River Thames, and sometimes I would stand where I could see the river for half an hour to see the ships and boats sail along, taking great pleasure therein. So he goes back to his uncle's again, and he agrees to work there until he finds an occupation that he wants to do. Still regularly he goes to the river to watch the ships and eventually he's approached by a man who says he's a ship surgeon and asks Barlow if he wants to go to Barbados with him. Now Barlow accepts providing his uncle agrees and his uncle doesn't agree and suspects that Barlow's been tricked by a kidnapper which was quite a common thing. And um, he refuses to let him go but at this point um, Barlow finally confesses to his uncle what his real ambition was. So I told my uncle sometimes that I had a great mind to go to sea, but my sister was against it and my uncle not very willing to it, knowing how many ill husbands and drunken fellows used to go to the sea and it was a place where many ill vices were in practice. So the attitude of Barlow's uncle and sister towards him going to the sea going to see reflects popular perceptions of the sea and of seamen which often featured in contemporary ballads, ballads such as The Mariner's Delight or The Seaman's Seven Wives which frequently related tales of the scurrilous behaviour of sailors. However despite his misgivings about the immorality of a seaman's life Barlow's uncle eventually relented and agreed to help him find an apprenticeship and in 1659 Barlow was at last able to fulfil what he called his longing desire to go to sea and was taken on as, a, as an apprentice in the Navy by the chief master's mate of the Naseby, which Barlow proudly described as the third best ship in England. And it's indicative of the strength of Barlow's wanting to go to sea that he signed the indentures for the seven-year apprenticeship without even having met his master, he didn't do a trial or anything. And considering he had complained bitterly about 
all the people that he tried apprenticeships before um, and constantly quarrelled about work with his uncle and aunt. I think it says that he did have a, a, a real urge to go to sea. But unfortunately, as, as soon as they set sail, Bolo had an accident and he was struck on the head by the capstan and knocked unconscious into the hold. So like Jonah, he defied authority by running away to sea, and this is almost a providential warning. And as I'll show later, Barlow's not alone in describing these seemingly punitive events occurring shortly after they embark on a life at sea. However, it didn't cause him to reconsider his decision, and anxious to start his new life, he continued on his journey on the Naseby, and they sailed to the Sound of Elsinore to assist the Swedes in the war with Denmark. So the tension between his calling to a life at sea and the hardships he endured as a consequence is present throughout Barlow's journal. He complains bitterly and often about the difficulties of a life of a mariner, as he terms it, the dangers and, poor tr and troubles poor seamen pass through. And he often speaks of being compelled or bound to a life at sea. He said, I had bound myself to a hard and miserable calling and there was no way for me but I must endure it. So he was bound for the term of his apprenticeship, but he continued to re refer to himself as being bound long after the apprenticeship has ended. And he, it's almost like he sees it as being called to a vocation um, and said, I always had a mind to see strange countries and fashions which made me bear these extremities with the more patience. For many men, the occupation of a seaman would be just one occupation amongst many that they did often seasonally. However, Barlow chose to remain a seaman for the rest of his life. He played a small part in the restoration of the monarchy by sailing along with Samuel Pepys in the Naseby to return Charles II to England. And he travelled the world sailing to the Barbary Coast, Africa and the Far East. He engaged Captain Kidd in combat. Though he hardly ever went ashore at all, I'm not sure how he managed this, but um, he married Mary Simons in 1678. I mean, he was literally unsure, I think, about six months in his life and they went on to have six children um, and gradually worked his way up through the ranks of the merchant navy his journal ends in 1703 but there was at least one further journey and in june 1705 barlow eventually achieved his ambition of becoming a captain on the east indiaman liampo which was sailing to mocha and on the 7th of january 1706 she sailed from portsmouth but was lost off the coast of mozambique and here Barlow's story ends and there's no evidence that he survived the wreck of the Liampo. Um, Edward Coxery, another sailor, was born in 1633 and lived till 1694. And he was sent at the age of 14 by his parents to live in France for a year in order to learn Fr French and prepare himself for a life in trade. And he did basically, a, a, he was kind of an exchange person. So they got a French boy coming to live to learn English and he went to learn French. So after returning to England, his parents, who were satisfied with the standard of, of his French by then, sent him to Middleburg in Zealand to be apprenticed to a wine cooper. Coxery stayed in Middleburg just a week before returning home. <coughs> when he was asked the reason for his re return, he says in his journal, I could give little account but did not like, which is kind of like the standard taciturn teenage answer to everything. Um, so he was forced to find another trade quickly and stated, I not settling in my mind to a trade, my lot fell to the sea. He didn't enjoy his first voyage, the weather was bad, he was really seasick and the master of the ship constantly chased him round and threatened to beat him with the end of a rope for whatever bizarre reason. Um, at the end of the voyage, Coxery returned to his parents, who hoped his experience would lead him to settle on safer and more lucrative trade. But this was not so, and he wrote, I was not long home, but the old tiresome tone was sounded again in my ears again, so they were moaning at him. What trade now, which grew unpleasant to me, for I was to seek then, as at the first, I could never settle my mind to any particular trade, so that I was like one who was neither at sea nor ashore. His unpleasant first voyage didn't, didn't deter him from maritime life, which he still preferred to the, the safer mercantile pursuits which his parents wanted for him. And at the age of 15, he was taken on as a boy on the St George. However, whilst anchored off Portsmouth, the St George was badly damaged by an explosion, suffering heavy loss of life. 
Coxery survived and returned home to Dover. Although he describes the explosion and accompanies his text with a vivid illustration of the St George aflame, which is there, you can just see it's slightly coloured, there's a bit of red fire coming out, and you can also see he's got lovely writing. Um, having spent quite a bit of time trying to transcribe some awful, awful writing, that is actually very beautiful. Thank you, Edward Coxery. Um, and he obviously wrote it from notes because this is kind of like a really smart copy and there's hardly any corrections in it at all. But there they are, all in the sea and rowing away from the St George on fire. Okay. Um, but like Barlow, he ignored this sort of providential warning <coughs> and embarked on a further voyage and spent the rest of his life as a seaman. He did become a pirate for a time um, and was relatively successful until he was captured and imprisoned by the Turks. Um, he returned home and converted to Quakerism um, and spent quite a lot of his later life in prison um, and died in Scarborough where he'd been in prison for quite some time. Um, he pursued his life at sea as a way of evading the career his parents had chosen for him. He didn't like the apprenticeship and the idea of fixing on a trade was unpleasant to him. He framed his decision less as a choice than fate because he said, my lot fell to the sea. But Coxery was a young man of good standing who possessed language skills and he rejected safer and far more lucrative options which would offer him a respected position in the community. So he was making an active choice and in choosing to go to sea, he was rejecting a powerful set of societal norms. Now finally, I'll talk about Richard Norwood and he was born in 1590 and lived till 1675 and he's a really exciting character. Um, he was much more overtly and actively defiant of parental authority. He began writing his journal in 1639 at the age of 49 after he became a devout Puritan. Norwood's father, Edward Norwood, was a gentleman farmer in Stevenage. And Norwood wrote that despite his parents and school teachers' efforts to, quote, plant in my heart some seeds of religion and the fear of God, he had excessive vanity and wickedness of my heart and mind even then. He illustrated this with anecdotes of his youthful pride and arrogance. He questioned the existence of God, he drinks and he fights, he had a brief attempt at coining, and, in, and intriguingly, he had a flirtation, I, I just love this, it's not really relevant, but I put it in because I love it so much. Um, he had a, a brief flirtation with the acting profession. So he said, at Stratford, when I was near 15 years of age, being drawn in by other young men of the town, I acted a woman's part in a stage play. I was so much affected with that practice that had not the Lord prevented it, I should have chosen it before any other course of life. So by the time he wrote his journal, Norwood had travelled to many exotic lands. He sailed with the pirate Henry Mannering. He invented the diving bell and he dived for pearls and he'd become the surveyor of Bermuda. He had a fantastic, he's a really interesting bloke. Um, and yet, it's this fleeting experience as a cross-dressing actor which stayed with him into adulthood as a profession he should have chosen before any other, which I think is great. Anyway, finally, his father lost patience with him, and in an attempt to settle him in a trade, at the age of 15, he apprenticed him to a fishmonger in London, who also dealt in sea cows. So you ate sea cows. I'm not even sure what sea cows were. I think they're, I don't know, like sea lions, I think. Um, but anyway, but young Norwood didn't, set, didn't take to it very easily and his new environment offered him the temptation of a different sort of life. His master's house was often visited by mariners in the course of selling sea cows undoubtedly um, and Norwood heard, overheard them and says, I heard them sometimes discourse of their sea affairs and of the art of navigation wherewith I was so much affected that I was most earnestly bent to both understand the art which seemed to me to reach as it were to heaven and to see the world and so eagerly were my affections bent to it that I resolved to go to the East Indies. Nord's description of his desire to go to sea hints at overreaching ambition. He resolved to travel and to master the art of navigation which he did. He was a very, very sought after navigator. Um, reaching to heaven and perhaps like Icarus, too close to the sun. 
Although Norwood's master finally agreed that he could serve out his apprenticeship with a kinsman who had a coastal trading ship, Norwood's desire for foreign travel wasn't satisfied. He was just basically going up to Yarmouth and coming back again. And so he abandoned the apprenticeship in the hope of finding a position on an ocean-going ship, and he was promptly put in prison for breaking the terms of his apprenticeship. He later viewed this as a fall from grace, a direct consequence of disobeying the wishes of his parents, his master and his friends. And he said, Thus having forsaken the calling wherein my parents had placed me and betaken myself to another course of life, without and against their liking, and without any due calling or encouragement from God or men, I met with many troubles. He spent the next 18 months wandering round Europe in poverty. He fell in with Catholic pilgrims travelling to Rome and embraced Catholicism, which was pretty shocking in those days. And in hindsight, Norwood describes this as a period of temptation. Eventually, after his time in the wilderness, Norwood returned to England. Although he remained estranged from both Protestantism and his parents, they were only reconciled after Norwood received a letter from his father in which he acquiesced to Norwood's wish to go to sea, as Norwood explained. Before, he was against my going to sea because he had never been acquainted with seafaring men, was altogether ignorant of that course of life and thought it the worst of all others, none of our kindred or acquaintance having taken that course. He and my mother had often laboured to discourage me by showing me some seafaring men in the city, how raggedly and slovenly they went, and sometimes deboiced and drunken. But now having dwelt some years in London, he understood it better and was content to further me in it. So on receiving that letter, Norwood was reunited with his parents and returned to Protestantism. <coughs> um, Norwood's re reneging on his apprenticeship in defiance of his parents' wishes and his subsequent adventures and tribulations can be read as a presentation of himself as a prodigal son. The parab uh, parable which was a popular model for spiritual autobiographies at the time. Yet although he offered repentance for his waywardness and was subsequently reconciled with his parents, he never repented of his desire to go to sea. And in fact, it's his father who acceded on that point. The trouble, this troubles the traditional telling of the prodigal son narrative, as despite his trials in the wilderness, Norwood got what he actually wanted, and at the age of almost 20, he was bound for five years to the <coughs> master's mate of a ship bound for the Mediterranean, and then he went on to Bermuda and spent most of his life in Bermuda after, as an adult. In conclusion, then, I want to return to Robinson Crusoe. When Crusoe voices his ambition to go to sea, his father, a wise and grave man, gives him a really long lecture about why he shouldn't pursue this course. He says that Crusoe can raise his fortune through application and industry, and that Crusoe should know his place. He told me it was for men of desperate fortunes on one hand, or of aspiring superior fortune on the other, who went abroad upon adventures, to, risk, to rise by enterprise and make themselves famous in undertakings of a nature out of the common road, that these things were all either too far above me or too far below me, that mine was a middle state, or what might be called the upper station of low life, <laughs> which, which he had found by long experience was the best state in the world, the most suited to human happiness. So Crusoe's father firmly argues for the maintenance of the status quo, as do the parents of all the men I've talked about, Clinton, the pirate, Barlow, Coxery and Norwood all rejected their father's wishes and abandoned apprenticeships in safe trades. In doing so, they rejected the patriarchal norms for young men where they should be subject to the authority of their fathers or their masters until such time as they married and settled into their own households. <coughs> These men took to the seas in pursuit of an alternative code of manhood. In Robinson Crusoe, Defoe's taken the essential stories of these real-life men and distilled them down to a morality tale. Crusoe is headstrong and subject to his passions, and it's only by undergoing his great trials that he comes to repentance and finally submits to the will of God and admits that his father was right. The journals of the men that I've talked about today all follow a similar format to the fictional tale of Crusoe, but with the crucial difference that they never repent their decision to go to sea. So despite experiencing many difficulties and having many opportunities to relinquish their choice of career, they never do. And with the exception of Coxery, 
who was undone really by his conversion to Quakerism because pacifist sailors weren't much in demand in the 17th century. Um, they were all expected to fire guns at each other. Um, all of the men I've discussed far surpass their fathers in wealth and status. Far from being a caution far from being cautionary tales, as Defoe would have us believe. These autobiographies show that even from a young age, some men recognised the sea was a space in which they could have, as the pirate Walter Kennedy termed it, the choice in themselves, and make their own exciting and exotic lives outside the normative hum humdrum routines of apprenticeship and trade. Thank you.